Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to Episode 51, The Spring Equinox, also known as Ostara. Hello, and welcome to Reaching for the Moon, presented by Everglades Moon Local Council, Florida Chapter of Covenant of the Goddess. COG supports individual works by its covens, members, and local councils. It's a vibrant network of a myriad of Wiccan and witchy resources, religious support, friendships, service opportunities, and more. To find out more, visit our website, emlc.net, our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Everglades Moon, or Twitter, at EMLC Tweets. Hi, this is Lady Bridget, and I'm so happy to bring you this episode of Reaching for the Moon. We are bringing you a workshop that was presented at Equinox in the Oaks last Ostara, and it's given by our own Alpandia. And the name of the workshop is Celebrating the Equinox in Florida. It's about how to reconcile celebrating the holidays when what's going on where you live in the climate that you live in does not match your traditions mythology. There is a lively discussion to follow. You might want to use earphones, might make it a little easier. We've done our usual editing magic to try and get rid of wind noise, plane noise, animal noises, uh, birds chirping, but you know how it is when you have an outdoor workshop, so that can be a little challenging, shall we say. But anyways, I hope you will enjoy listening to it as much as I did. It really is wonderful. And we're bringing you some music from Aradia from her album, Songs for All Seasons. I hope you enjoy it. Hail to the wind that is her breath. to the circle Welcome girl Morning star song of the sky Hail to the flame that lights her soul Ah! 
Let me introduce myself and kind of give you a little background. My name's Alpandia. You also might know me as Stacy, because uh, that's how I post all the time on Facebook. I'm also Pandy, and uh, if you've ever heard the EMLC podcast, I, I do our uh, Pandy's Pagan Projects, because they're fun. And I've been in Florida for about 20 or so years now. Feels it's like half my life. Grew up in New York. And when I first got into paganism, it was much easier, to, when I first got into Wicca, it was much easier to see, like, the story of the god and goddess being played out in nature around me, because the cycles up in upstate and downstate New York, very similar to Europe, where the mythos that I practice as a Strega uh, came from, from, you know, the climate and everything. But moving to Florida, you know, it's a little hard. You know, Santa looks weird in Bermuda shorts. And uh, it's weird sometimes to wrap your brain around some, uh, at least for me, uh, to wrap my little Hermione brain around the fact that, you know, this brings its head up at Yule for me all the time, uh, helping to plan for turning tides rituals and general rituals, where the mythos talks about how the goddess has descended into the underworld and the whole world is barren and cold and the hard pop snowy whatevers, and it's like, uh, we're standing in a green field with trees and animals and my farmer's market where I got the food that is I'm feeding y'all with tonight is filled with all sorts of veg that's being grown three miles from my house. Not quite Yuli. So, um, and there's a couple of different, um, holidays, pagan holidays, uh, Sabbaths that are like that in some East Spring Equinox is is one of them. So I just want to share with you kind of what I see and we'll start talking about what maybe other people have in their in their mythos and then we can we'll dive into maybe how we can start to adapt some of this for for Florida. So from both my strega teachings and practice and rituals I've participated in from spring equinox, a lot of spring equinox is about the goddess coming back from the underworld and the world. So it's about the, the goddess coming, starting her, her return from the underworld and the world waking up. And springtime is when the, the cold starts to retreat and hopefully soon up north they'll stop having snow. Just to get seven inches. Oh my god! So far <laughs> where are, where are you? Like the like, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, like, Philadelphia. You guys are fun. But, you know, but, but it, it tends to be this time of year when up north, you're, you're like, okay, it's not so bitterly cold. And I saw some buds coming up through the gross grass. And then, you know, everything's waking up and everything's fertile. And this is when you plant your seeds and da 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 da. Some people think it being as the time when the god and goddess first make love and she becomes pregnant because it's nine months to Yule. Some people are very specific, like it's women have a nine month cycle. So the goddess will have a nine month cycle. Other traditions see it at different times of the year. But a lot of the rites and rituals talk about the awakening of, of the earth and the budding of new plants and the budding of new life. And that's why it's hairs and eggs and all sorts of stuff. Does that kind of jive with what you guys have experience with spring? Am I missing anything? The balance of light and dark. Balance of, yeah, the balance of light and dark. And, and the god and goddess being on equal footing and, and things like that. Anything else? Like there's a fertility magic. Lots of fertility magic. I think in part because it taps into that awakening. So yeah, so a lot of the magic at, at spring equinox and even the mythos talks about Things waking up, the earth waking up from her long winter's nap, and all of the, a lot of the things that we do at this time of year all tap <laughs> into that. But it's not exactly, at least to me, what's really kind of going on around us. I mean, we've been green like this for months and months and months. 
since Florida is either tropical or subtropical, depending on how far down you go, I believe, you know, our ancestors looked at and created a mythos based on the cycles they were seeing. And if my ancestors and it were in Italy or even up north in, in Ireland, they didn't have this kind of weather in March and April. So when they started to see those stirrings, obviously there was something else going on. So it kind of makes it a little challenging to, to overlay the mythos when it comes from a different place. And, you know, friends of ours who've moved to, to like Australia are having have these same conversations over and over again because theirs is completely upside down. But like here in Florida, we're kind of, at least my impressions are, we're, we're getting to like the end of one of the big uh, uh, growing seasons. We've had fresh fruit and vegetables and lettuces and stuff in farmer's markets since October. So, I mean, and a lot of the farmer's markets roll up at the end of April, beginning of May, because it's harder to grow those kind of foods later on in the year. Um, we're getting ready for our rainy season and our hot season and our not saying the word season. So, which all makes it much more challenging to grow anything except for super hardy plants or things that you really have to tend. And we are seeing some kind of sun-related uh, aspects of spring. We still have we're at the tail end of, of like orange blossoms, like that might like around spring equinox. Um, we've got those. Um, I always say the, the tree wrong. Those trees that have the big yellow blooms that look like trumpets. They're what tab tab tababuya, the tababuya trees. Uh, much to the chagrin of people who have allergies. And, you know, Florida's blanketed with a nice yellow carpet of pollen <laughs> this time of year. To me, I kind of see Florida as where the goddess comes to vacation when it's too cold in Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania because it's way too much snow. So what other types of things do you all see when you're looking at, like, this teetering energy as we're heading into spring in Florida? I, I know I've missed that. I see my Demaria drop its leaves in November and become <clears throat> a dead looking stick. Right. Yeah. And then now it's starting to sprout. True. True. My maple tree in the backyard <laughs> that has been throwing leaves on me all, all fall winter is now done with that and it's starting to leave. Your maple tree is? That's cool. It's starting to leave. Yeah, because I'm sick of scraping leaves. Out. <laughs> yeah, I noticed my plumeria. I, I thought I had killed it because we, we transported it. And yeah, my plumeria is blooming, starting to, to get its leaves, and it'll probably bloom in another like couple weeks. Interesting. I was just talking to Steve not too long ago about my fig tree that he got me. And I thought, well, it looks dead. <laughs> um, but. Is there life in it? I don't know. We'll see. And then I talked to him. He goes, oh, yeah. It's like it drops its leaves every year and comes back. I didn't know. I thought that it was just like a really hot time or something. And that's why, you know, because I transplanted it not long after it dropped its mm -hmm. leaves. And now I've got little green buds coming out. So that's on a positive um, yeah. spring coming note. But then it's so hot in South Florida that I've got plants outside that are full sun plants. Like I've got a, a bay plant, bay leaf. And it's like scorching, and I, I water it all the time, and man, is it hot there. Yeah, it feels like they're full sun, except in Florida, because we're like three inches oh, from the sun. sun. Right, so yeah, full sun, sun, sun right. Right. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. in the sun. Mediterranean spot. sun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's because it's the end of the dry season, and everything's stressed right now because it's so, it's so dry. I've been watering it. It's not dead, but the leaves are like brownish green, so yeah. they look like they're dead. I mean, it's hot, but like those, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about bay, bay leaves. Or yeah. Tree, and then I have a loquat little plant that I got, and the leaves are yellow. Mm -hmm. Everything is very, to, for me, what's happening right now is there's two things I noticed. The animals are all breeding. Mm -hmm. breeding. So that's very spring like. You see, like, I've seen snakes a bunch the last couple of weeks because they're out and about looking for their friends, and well, birds are making nests and having babies and stuff like that. But then the end of the dry season, beginning of the rainy, to me is almost like the energy of the end of winter, beginning of spring. Yeah. There's a very strong transition there where if, when it finally starts to rain, it's like, oh my God, finally, finally. It's almost like a sense of relief. Yeah. 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 
so so it's a, but it's so that's a different kind of seasonal change because like up north you're talking about like it's gradual. Know, the, it's a, a little, little bit like a one little, day's warm and then it's cold again for a long time. Or or but but even you know like I remember being up north and not starting to plant things until after Mother's Day. Yeah. After Mother's Day, I struggled with that when I moved different. here from up north. And 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 down here, I have to I plant things in like October. The planting thing is different. Yeah, the, the, I and and like, always planting. Like, yeah, you, you can. can. Plant all year round, if you plant it right. Yeah, you can. You can. Like I had to move my my rue inside because from coral because she was getting a little scorched outside. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a different way that the the goddess wakes up and the god wakes up down in Florida than than <laughs> might be represented in like quote unquote traditional Wiccan mythos. What I, I didn't hear what you said. Temperature of the water. Oh yeah, yeah. About time of the year when you can actually gingerly go <laughs> because it's not too cold <laughs> manatee migration and everything migration uh, i i watched uh my favorite sign that spring is sprouting is uh i watched a car carrier at pga national get loaded up with all sorts of different colored uh, license plates that aren't florida uh-huh. so going <laughs> The snowbirds go home. We like that migration pattern. Yeah, yeah. By Mother's Day, and and I noticed I've not I've been noticing um, the the sandhill cranes now all have their 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 two little babies yeah, and they're walking they're around. Somewhere. Are yeah, there? Yeah. Oh, I'll have to pitch it. No, those ones are the red. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Something. We didn't know anything about that because we had just moved here and we bought a house and we called him Barry and he would always come by our back window. And how do we how do we reconcile that with what's going on around us? Do we just kind of chuck it and start our own cycle down here in Florida? Um, do we shift everything so maybe if we want to tap into that, we can grow whatever we want energy in Florida. Maybe we celebrate the fall equinox as kind of like that fertility planting time, even though it doesn't quite match up with some of the wildlife. <laughs> But if, you know, from what we can control and our, um, our interactions with the land, that might be a, a way to do it. Or do we just take a look at the mythos and go deeper and um, just kind of adjust the language? You know, maybe we don't mention that the earth is frozen and barren and at Yule when we're in Florida. Maybe it's just we just talk about how how the goddess and god are being represented in different ways in in nature um and that's personally my my favorite because i think there is a big power to tapping into the words and ritual of people who came before you and keeping up with that and repeating it the you tap into that power going back you know sometimes only several years sometimes you can go back generations depending on on your traditions and it kind of just feels wrong not to be doing spring equinox and this is where i i empathize with cosette you know uh who's down in australia and looking at like sowin looking for sowin supplies around beltane and seeing halloween decorations when it's you know her beltane so because they're flipped in australia but I, I still have a kind of pesky Hermione brain that fires off that goes, you know, like that the well, goddess is waking up and the earth is breaking out of its hibernation and 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 it just doesn't kind of let me. I can't. I, I'm having trouble shaking it, and that's kind of where this workshop started from, because that's been my my journey for the past year or so has been to 
shake out some of those cobwebs and shake out some of the rigidity of what's going on and to keep the, the basis of what we're doing, but incorporate some more Southern Florida elements to it. So what I wanted to do was kind of have, uh, now that all the prefacing is done, have a little bit of like a round table about like the different aspects of, of the mythos and the myth used at this time of year and see how we could maybe start to overlay some Florida-ness into it. Sound cool? Sound not so cool? So one of the, one of the first things obviously is that the goddess is beginning, the goddess is beginning her ascent from the, from the underworld. So how would you see that in Florida? I know it's a challenge because a lot of us come from craft traditions that are based in, you know, Europe at a mm-hmm. different latitude, right? But the day, it's still darker in the winter. And for me, the dryness has replaced the coldness. Yeah. Like that's kind of my, so for me, she's still, she's still ascending. The days are getting longer. It's getting lighter. The heat's a whole different thing, but um, I think for me, it's the dryness and the dark and light. I can't, I have a hard time reconciling the agricultural piece of it because it just doesn't match for me. So right. I use other allegory and specifically the dark and light and the, and the dry and wet. See, her moisture is coming out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do the same thing. I think the agricultural part is just really, like, temperate Europe has a one agricultural cycle a year. Maybe the Mediterranean was different. I mean, there isn't a diff- there is a different agricultural mm-hmm. cycle for Mediter- like the Greek recon people don't get locked into that same descent. Right. But Northern European definitely different than where we are. So we kind of drop the agriculture. And luckily, Georgian Wicca, even though it's BTW, it's you know it was written by a guy who lived in Southern California. So there's not so much of the agricultural emphasis um, on the mythos, and it's more just about the dance of the god and goddess kind of coming apart and then coming together and then going apart and coming together and that we kind of tend to emphasize more. So I feel like Beltane and Samhain are big and in the Georgian tradition they're the points where the God and Goddess unite. And then otherwise they're kind of doing different things in different places. So you can follow that cycle as well. But for me Florida with the dry I always feel like there's a longing for the the earth is longing for the rain which to me is very similar to the longing and the mythos that leads up to Beltane. Mm-hmm. They consummate at Beltane. So there's mm-hmm. a, and by Beltane, we usually have rains, or they've started, or they're like At least going it's super it. human. Yeah. 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 So I think, too, that the, the agricultural cycle, the strict agricultural cycle, when you think about, like, growing grain and, and you know, pounding it out and, and making it into bread, and that's your llamas and lunasa and that kind of stuff, like, I think I, that has very little relevance, I, I think, to most people, you know, in a in, in a society where you buy your bread at the grocery store. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, you have to look for other things, whether you're in Florida or New York or, or in Manhattan. Uh, you know, ain't nobody growing no grain um, <laughs> on Fifth Street. Um, Definitely not threshing the grain. Right. Like ain't nobody oh, yeah. doing that in Central Park, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so you know, the, the agricultural symbols. But So then you look for what else there is, whether it's rain or, like, for me, up, up a little bit further north. To me, I know it's springtime when, like, the azaleas bloom. Like, even, you know, th- there are still cyclical, whether it's your plumeria or whether it's your fig tree or whether it's your, uh, you know, azaleas or whatever. There are markers of seasons. Yeah, it's hot. We can't go with the mythos of, like, the world is dead and there's, you know, and a blanketed in snow, right? we got to take that. That language maybe we can abandon. But when the azaleas come up, like, you know it's springtime. You know, when your fig has leaves, when your plumeria whatever your other I don't know anything about plants um that's my story yeah down here we can say the mangoes blooming I've got little yes. little yeah. tiny mangoes on my mango tree we got the peach tree has got flowers on it so I want to touch on something you said River you're talking about talking about the different language so and I'm not necessarily like River you have to tell me if, it, if anybody wants to jump in so so how might we change that language that's in ritual like uh, that that specifically kind of speaks to like maybe your ritual has that or if it doesn't like how would you maybe suggest to somebody that this is a way that you can talk about how things are waking up but with more florida and less northern like we're not obviously not talking about snows and and, and that kind of barrenness but we have our own 
dry seasons and we have our darkness like i mean mm-hmm. it, you yeah. know well, like the, even with this site this is where we're it's later than we usually are it's much greener yeah now we walked out there in the woods yesterday and it's just completely different than it looks when we were here earlier in the year mm-hmm. so, the birds like too also we um i noticed this both Ostara and even in both a little bit, the, but definitely Ostara, the bird song is much more noticeable because they're really like tons of mockingbirds trying to get it on and talking <laughs> about it. At night, even when we're doing rituals. Yeah, it was one o'clock in the morning. Um, we were chatting last night and I finally wandered back to the cabin and there were two owls attempting uh, to meet. They won't be outside. <laughs> that was. Like, what the hell? That was last night. It's quite the ruckus. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that kind of goes into the next thing because, like, a, a lot of times, they, uh, a lot of different mythos talk about the puberty of the god and goddess at this time of year. So that's kind of easier because we can see that reflected in, in the birds. <laughs> and sometimes the people. And the people. Everybody's Twitter page is Twitter yeah, paid it. Spring break. Yeah. Well, that that is yeah, spring absolutely. break for sure. That, that's a big sign in Florida when spring is here. <laughs> and I think that even though the, the maybe the agricultural or the weather related or you know phenomenon kind of things maybe aren't happening, <coughs> there still obviously is like a lot of physical and physiological relevance. You know, like people do get maybe more depressed in the winter, or you know, you do tend to. I tend to. Look at the, you know, look out outside. Say, ah, oh, it's five p.m. I'm going home. You know, I'm not out. I'm not enjoying life. Right. I'm not doing things. It's not. It's not light out. I'm ready to go to sleep at six thirty. That you is know? one of the and tricky so, ones, though, because, it, like in our mythos, it's about the, you know, the dark half of the year is supposed to be introspective, and the light half is supposed to be very active. But actually, Florida, like the winter is super busy. Right, because it's not because it's so nice, hot. and the yeah. summer is slower because you, yeah. you're staying inside all the time in the AC, and there's not as many activities planned. Right. People don't have right. festivals, yeah. you know. So it's sort of flips. Sometimes I shy away from that language because right. it feels like it's kind of the opposite. But the so the so the but what I was saying is like the, the metaphor is still the same. There are times of intro, there are times of extra. You know, there are times of thought. There are times of activity. So I think that there's there's relevance to following that and to, to incorporating that because it, it's still those parts still hold true. There's an animal attempting a mating dance right behind. Oh uh, yeah, he's doing uh, his little dance. Oh yes, an animal. Yeah. Oh, the lizard on the yeah. log. Like popping up and down Pop and showing off his thing. <laughs> I can see what rain right the the makes sense, especially when uh, you've got a lot shoulder. of people traveling down here during the winter. You know, and for them, this is like vacation time fun. It's, you know, that they're getting away from cold. And that's why there's so many events and things going on maybe towards them. But for me, when it's dark out, I feel like, let's just go home. I don't want to go to the gym. It's like, oh, no, it's dark. Yeah. I don't want to go to the gym. I don't want to go to the store. I just want to go home and, like, mm-hmm. like kind of do nothing because yeah. I don't. But when it's light out later, I love it. I'll go and do stuff in the yard and work yeah. out late. That's and really not even being, like, sure. active, just in my yard doing things. I feel more productive. Yeah, and, and being out later is not so bad because it's getting it's starting to get a little cooler, like, later in the evening, you know. Um, but I know, like, right now is when all the 5Ks are happening down oh, here yeah. and yeah, the, yeah. the tries are going. And, like, we have friends who are coming down yeah. from Maryland to do a try this weekend in Daytona. So, and it's, you can't do that there quite yet. Um, they have, like, their, their crazy frozen people triathlons and it's like and you get hot cocoa at the end and you get hot cocoa in the end because you have this like you have to swim in basically clothing you know because you're in you're in the dry suits from from diving but yeah definitely i guess you know i kind of get like I, I get really stuck sometimes in that whole like and i know i'm not the only one but the seeing like taking things very literally in ritual and so when something gets said that pings wrong because it's not what's going on. That's kind of, it, it takes me out of mm-hmm. that ritual space. And so that's why, you know, what, that's why I said some of my work has been to, to try and reconcile that so that I don't necessarily have that. Perhaps it's like you were, we were talking about earlier is how you frame it. Yeah. Like if I say, well, traditionally, this is how it was over there in ritual, you say that. But then you mentioned, but here we look at, you know, mm-hmm. the time when it's rainy season or it's dry or it's light and dark. And then, you know, you both aspects to it so mm-hmm. that you can 
you know, um, embrace the traditional, but yet at the same time acknowledge how we're living. Well, the hurricane season comes. No. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, I said the word. We'll, we'll edit that out. <laughs> well, you're in the too, which is, you know, moves us away from the literal anyway, which is sort of why we do what we do. So, yeah, I have a overlaying the allegory. Yeah. Growth is harvest growth. Harvest is harvest. Yeah. Planting is planting. Yeah. Even if it is, you're, so you're not harvesting in your field, but you're going back to school or you're learning a new thing. Well, that's planting and, and then harvesting. Uh, you know, you can you can participate in the cycle metaphorically, mm-hmm. uh, for sure. It's all supposed to be allegory. I mean, right. No, I, it, I feel like what, you know, the, the myth of the goddess that we've inherited in traditional witchcraft is still, it's just supposed to be allegory for it. energy change and cycle of life. Yeah. Things. So, you know, kind of letting go of the words. And just, I mean, and I totally think you're right. It, that happened to me a lot, too. With things, if somebody was talking about the cold of winter and we're sweating, it was like, what the heck is this working for me? It's like, oh, too much of a stretch. And, and I can stretch some, but, you know. And, and I do see, I, I mean, I, I, and I, and I feel that, you know, we can, working with the mythos, Working with the mythos is important, and working with the cycles of nature is important. And it's that getting the two of them to talk together when we're in our ritual space, uh, while using what we've inherited, and then adapting and not losing the roots of it, but just adapting it for where we are, so that it just makes more sense, and you don't have that jarringness of ritual when something gets said that is completely foreign to you. Like East and West. Yeah. She's not here. You can't talk about that. <laughs> well, I struggle with that. We're not shearing sheep, but if we got a long-haired dog, we may. Oh yeah. You know, shave him down for the summertime. Yes. Yeah, and I don't know whether whether it, it evolved out of our. I mean, I mean, we just don't talk about ice. I can't remember. I'm, I'm trying to think of where we in our liturgy where there might be some of that conflict, and I just don't know whether because the trad was kind of all over the country that didn't fold in. I mean, there's not discussion of ice. Because I'm thinking, what would be my thing? I mean, cold, right? Right. And sometimes we talk about cold, particularly at Yule. Sometimes we're sometimes all wrapped it is And sometimes it is chilly at Yule. Well, but but yeah. sometimes it's 80 degrees. <laughs> yeah, right. Sometimes it is, yeah. So I think I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure how it happened, but it's and our time is a little less bad. I can't, can you think of any time where it just, there wasn't, um, uh, what's the word, you know, cohesiveness. Found out for more conflict. I can't, so somehow we pulled it out. Or it was designed, I don't know. Right. Yeah, how it happened. Yeah. You know, another very Florida thing, I don't know if you want to, this could just be a tangent, but, or another workshop, but having a covenant in Miami has been different than any other place I've been in the covenant part because we have a lot of people, sometimes half the covenant, who aren't European fam- cultural mm-hmm. ancestry. And so they like the coloring eggs thing. It's a new thing. It's not a, it doesn't mean Ostara to them to color eggs. Um, um, we come up, we, we bump up against stuff like that every once in a while. Things that are like really deeply embedded in cultural practices more. Um, Thanksgiving is not a thing for, that's not you know, so much it's sort of the way we do Mabin. We have done yeah, Mabins, which are Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's what, yeah. Thanksgiving is not a thing for some of them. It's, it's, I mean, it's really interesting because it frees you up to think, how would, you know, how can we Speaking of that, can I, I have a question. Um, uh, my dad being Cuban, as far as I know, they don't have any mythology. Does anybody know of mythology that comes from the Hispanic population? Because he didn't grow up knowing any of these fairy tales and any of that stuff. I mean, do they have their own? Other I mean, than, other than if they're really Spanish. Spanish. No, if, they're, if their family's really Spanish, then yeah. they could have some. Like, Andres is from northern Spain, which is a Celtic That's area. Celtic, yeah. Yeah. A lot of um, specific myths, but I don't know, other parts of Spain. But then there's a lot of people in Cuba who are so far removed from their Spanish Right, family, family. Yeah, and they all mix together. So yeah. I just I thought that was so odd because it's like my dad doesn't know, didn't know anything about Cinderella, Beauty and the Beast, or have any of their own mythology. And I thought, you know, even if he had Indian that was infused in, they probably have, you know, Indian culture has a 
own mythologies, but they don't have them. I thought, well, I wonder if other South Americans, do they have, maybe because they have Indian influence, Native South Americans? Well, yeah, like Mexico, like Coco. That's all based in Mexican myth. Yeah, they do. Indigenous yeah. myth that survived. Yeah, well, I just thought it was strange to have a culture with no mythology. Well, they have Yoruba culture. They have Yoruba I was going to ask. I mean, they all know who Yamaya and Oshima. You know, that's true. That's okay. kind of one of the things. The Santeria like, stuff. They yeah, do know that. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. yeah. Right. But then Cuba, too, is, is like, yeah, it, it didn't start that way, right? <laughs> it's like uh, you have slave trade and, and all kinds of other uh, things that imported all kinds of varieties of different cultures and sometimes suppressed other cultures <laughs> intentionally um, and then, you know, kill off a couple cultures too. A generation knew what, what it was. Like, you right. heard the books and they kill you, but you knew what it was. It's not that you didn't have it, but you don't talk about it. Right. Yeah. Do you celebrate the saints or the, um, you know, the Orishas? They know about their certain days. Yeah, my Santa Barbara, Shango. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. cool. That's that, that that makes sense. You know, you just think of everybody must know like Snow White and like everywhere. You know, but, but no. Yes, yeah. Northern European. So, um, are there any other? It's actually a really relevant tangent because you know if you think about the number of people in the craft of Florida who, at some point in time, do something related to Yamaya. I mean, it's really pervasive. It's like, become a pretty. She's a pretty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even if people aren't doing exactly what a century person would do, you know, it's like that's a way I think the craft has very much changed in Florida compared to other. Although Yamaya is also very big all up in the Northeast. She she is. I know from my personal experience um, in dealing with the weather in Florida. Um, in order to try and safeguard my house, you know, I was definitely making my offers, my offerings to Neptune and Salacia and, and, but I knew there was this whole other deity who lived here and, and had some association with the storms and the, and the ocean and, and whatnot. And so it felt right to, to go to her for, as part of my, my prep for storms. So, like she's got one side and Neptune's got the other side and they get along pretty good. So the kind of circle back, are there any other things that you can think about that maybe are, that may have been in ritual that like are, have that kind of Eurocentric view that would be able to be like that we haven't talked about, touched on yet that might be able to be adapted for how we circle in Florida or what we're seeing in Florida. Oak and Holly thing. Oh, good point. Oak and Holly yeah. is a struggle of mine and... Florida Holly. It is. Yes. Come into a school. You talking about using Oak and Holly for your ritual and like Yule and so forth? It's just a metaphor. You know, I did a Yule ritual at my house and I didn't use Oak and Holly. Um, I did... Um, Baldur, the the Norse gods, was the mistletoe, you know, and how um, Hodor and Baldur, you know about that myth? Yeah, Hodor was the brother of... That's, that's that. Game of Thrones. It's true, and it's also the name of the brother of the Baldur, right? They're, they're brothers in the Norse mythology, and Baldur was killed by the mistletoe. And Hodor was blind. And, yes. And Loki talked him into throwing this in the cosmos. Yes. And he put every plant that she didn't get. She didn't get to the mistletoe. The mistletoe, right. and so they and thought Loki it was the nine. And he didn't kill them. It was the one thing that he promised to, yeah. to not hurt him, yeah. Right. So, yeah, no, so. I get that, though, because the oak and the holly and the plants. So, I mean, the way I reconcile that is that the younger, the older, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. if I don't associate that plant with that time of year, but instead, it's you know, the, the place of the king or whatever. I mean, that's how we... It's the thing that gets balanced with light That's day, right. I mean, you know? it, it, it goes, yeah, back to me, it's for dark and light. Mm-hmm. You know, well, here's an idea. Maybe we could look towards the Native Americans because, you know, they're from this continent, not from Europe. And there's Native Americans that are in the south as well as the north. Mm-hmm. Maybe we could look towards them to see what kind of it's celebrations good. and rituals they do during those times of year. No, well, no, no, because they get really... I mean, because I know we usually do um, some kind of celebration with them in mind during, what is it, uh, Lunasa? Or, um, I, I've done that. Like the heart because when I lived in Tallahassee, we went to the, um, 
we were invited guests at the Creek Square Grounds, and their biggest celebration of the entire year is um, Green Corn Ceremony. So we do in June when the corn, the first ears of corn are ready, and um, it's a really, really big deal. Everything in the whole year wraps around. I don't understand all of the different things they do, but basically that's what this thing. So I've done a lick of before that was focused on corn, with like yeah, the corn goddess and. Yeah, I mean, it kind of works. It kind of works for, for both the traditional pantheon and also the Florida or southeastern U.S. The green corn mm-hmm. ceremony is really big in the southeast U.S. Well, when I go to Cups over in Fort Lauderdale, they do a different pantheon almost every, mm-hmm. you know, almost every Sabbath. They're doing Norse, they're doing Celtic, probably Celtic, some fairies. And they always do Native American at that time of year, and probably for that reason. That's a festival. What would they do in the so, Steve, you're, if you're looking at the oak and holly at that, those times of year, since you're my true guy, are there plants that you see that could would take the place of those in transition for Florida? There's some sort of trees over Florida. I think the Christmas tree. Yeah, the Christmas one. Christmas cactus because it blooms in between like Thanksgiving and New Year's. No, I know, but <laughs> oh, what that's what I'm working on. Yeah. But I mean, I think if you're trying to think about the oak, the, the traditional meaning of oak and holly is the oak has lost all its leaves and it looks dead and it's old, and, but the holly's evergreen and holds that energy in the green world until the fruit comes back to spring. So you'd have to find a tree that drops its leaves, which there aren't that many. Yeah. <laughs> Plumerians. Yeah. Cypress does? Yeah. When does it drop its leaves? I, I, I was asking when. I didn't know. I don't know a lot. Okay. And my gumbo limbo does, too. That's a Florida tree. And, you know, isn't, isn't Cypress associated with underworld stuff? Yes. So. And liminal space. And liminal space. And water. Land, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Huh. That might be a good one. Of course, the sable palm green So it could be the it could be the cypress and the sable palm. So write that down. Uh, our pines here don't lose their pines. I mean, their leaves, right? Right. Except for the cedar. So you could be the cypress and the pine. Well, what about the thorn needles we have everywhere? Those these. But it doesn't like they don't. Yeah, but they never lose their leaves. According to all trees lose their leaves. Even if they're not deciduous, they cycle. They cycle. Well, yeah. Yeah. Right. You don't notice because they're not all necessarily all skin. Right. Yeah, that's not like this. They cross the seeds. They drop the needles as soon as you get your yard clean. Yeah. That's the cycle. Cycle of rake and drop. <laughs> that's, that's the Cersei cycle. <laughs> I like that about the cypress and the sable palm. Because of that, because I was I was talking with um, with Lord Orion about different trees that are associated with underworld and ancestor work, and it was cypress and blackthorn and I think you. So, but we were talking about cypress because it's Florida trees. Yeah. I noticed um, for Imbolc, I just shifted to Bridget. I focus on Bridget a lot because mm-hmm. the whole, you know, it's snowy and the first light yep. and you're shearing the, the first milk and, and you're getting that. the milk. None of that really works. And that's all our ritual stuff. All our yeah. rituals are about that. So focus coming through the snow. Yeah, <laughs> see, but that, that's it. Yeah, you know, because so like, because we have... At Lupercus in February, we have, you know, the, 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 the wolf god chases away the wolves of winter that are ravaging the stores of food that you squirreled away to get you through the winter. And it's like, but the farmer's market, you know, <laughs> like, it, like it, I have to drive past it every week, which is why it's been totally on my mind. And it's like, you see all of the rainbow of, of foods and yeah. stuff. And Where's that tradition? Lupercus? I don't know. That's Strega. Yeah, the wolf god, uh, uh, Lupercus and Lysitia are the god and goddess, and he's the, the sun god, uh, he's honored in February. It's where Lupercalia comes from. 
which give us Valentine's Day somehow. So <laughs> it's another fertility thing where they uh, have a sacrifice of, I want to say lambs, but now I'm not sure, goats. And they run through the streets, the, the priests run through the streets and spank people with the, the tongs soaked in the blood for fertility. And, oh. Yeah. It's messy. The Roman cycle in general is not as tied to you. Is it tied to <laughs> agricultural stuff? It is to a degree. Um, I mean, it depends on which Roman stuff you're looking at. If you're looking at the state religion versus the not so state religion, because the state religion was like it felt like the state religion was kind of agnostic of all of that. It was just, and now it's Saturnalia. It's like, well. Why? <laughs> Don't they focus on the, the, like the sun, what the sun is doing more so? There's a lot of the sun. The solstices yeah. and equinoxes. Isn't that where they, we got so, those four Sabbaths from? Could be. Yeah, I'm still looking at like the differences between like some of the Strega practices, which is why I'm excited for Grace's book, because that'll have, I hopefully have a little more folk stuff than I, that I, than I've had, versus the, the like the reconstructionist stuff, which is, Ablutions when you wash your hands, and ablutions when you cross a doorway, and ablutions, and it's like, huh? ablutions, oh. like, like honorings, like, there's a, there's a prayer as you wash your hands, and a prayer when you walk into a house to a different God, and when you first walk in the house, there'll be a, either like a Vesta shrine or a Hestia shrine, and you make an offering there, because she's first and last, and then this and that, and it's like, you're like, how did they ever get any? Done. I know. I mean, like, some of it I like because they have, like, the, the gods as the crossroads are the lares, which are the ancestral spirits, and they have different offerings. I there. think you need to do a workshop on that stuff. Well, once I figure I it out. Heard, I don't know about any of that. Lord, uh, Chloe's got a lot of that pinned down, so. And, and she's done some workshops at Tides, like, that are specific to specific deities and practices. But Apparently at Mary Meet, there's going to be a really kick-ass, kick workshop slash devotion. That's good to know. So back on the wheel of the year, I mean, yes. it's important to remember, too, is that, you know, because we were talking about the state religion versus the, you know, none of this stuff was done everywhere all the time. Right. Nobody had eight Sabbaths on a wheel of the year. Right. You know, every little village had its own cycle according to its prominent features, like they were near this mountain or this stream or mm -hmm. whatever, you know, and um, it was according to what was relevant to them, you know, a, a milking, a, a shepherding a village maybe or you know may have their own thing or maybe just the shepherds in the village would have right. their own thing um you know depending on how big your city state was and so on and so forth and so this is all an arbitrary system that's put in the place for us but it doesn't necessarily you know doesn't necessarily have to have we don't have to follow it to the letter right our ancestors are not celebrating ambulk and the mill thing and then this and then that you know on a six-week cycle they were doing it according to their lives, you know? And so that's where the allegory, I think, is important in some of those other pieces of, of finding relevance where we are. Very true. Does anyone have anything else to add? Well, I thank you for being part of this discussion. And uh, <laughs> this was fun and very informative. At least for me. <laughs> I don't know how y'all enjoyed it, but I had a good time. <laughs> to the meadow I heard a voice calling me come where the sunlight is streaming run tumbling laughing long singing a laughing song dance to the tune your heart is beating and welcome
is making me restless and fearless and free to welcome the Mary Goddess, welcome the life that she brings, welcome the long happy hours, welcome, oh welcome the come. Sunlight to starlight with wildflowers plated like jewels in my hair. There's somebody waiting in sweet expectation for me. Won't you wait for me? Wait for me there to welcome.